Hello, I'm Eric Blue. I'm the host of the Multifamily Night of the Real Estate Roundtable. I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, our presenter tonight is Neil Bawa of the Multifamily University and Grow Capitus. Um, I understand he's on his way, he's not here yet, but by the time we get to his presentation, he should be here. Um, I've seen Neil present a bunch of times and he's one of the best presenters on uh, multifamily real estate out there. Very data-driven approach. Um, I'm so glad you guys are here to see this tonight. Uh, we're also sharing this on Facebook Live tonight. Uh, so this will be going out to all your friends on Facebook. Uh, it's under their Real Estate Roundtable group page. Is that correct, Colton? That is correct. Uh, also, we're recording it, so the entire um, presentation will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, give us a little time to edit that, and we'll send out a link when that's available. Uh, so here's our agenda for tonight. Uh, so we started networking at 6 o'clock. You probably already know that. We were supposed to start at 6.30, but we're running a little late trying to get everybody in the room. Uh, about 7.15 or thereabouts, we'll be taking a 15-minute break, after which Neil will present. So about 7.30, 7.45 for that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Fulton 80 Tap House. Uh, they're our primary sponsor for this. Uh, thanks to all you guys um, visiting the bar and buying food. Uh, that's what keeps the room free. Uh, so we're one of the few real estate clubs that is free for attendees. So um, please patronize the bar uh, so we can keep providing this content to uh, all would-be real estate investors for free. Uh, okay, uh, I know we ran out. We have so many new members tonight. So if you're here for the first time, please raise your hand. Holy moly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for coming out and you know, thank you for wanting to learn this material and, and further your, uh, your, your financial education. Um, uh, for, uh, I realize not everybody got their uh, sticker, but uh, for all us regulars who come to the round table all the time, make, make an extra effort to reach out to the people with the first time stickers, make them feel welcome. Uh, we hope that you return over and over again. Uh, meet our team. In fact, we just were discussing that our team has actually grown. Um, so where's Keegan? Um, you guys will meet Keegan in a minute. And Colton, oh, there you are. <laughs> I do that to you every time. Um, but I want to give a special shout out to our hostesses. So tonight in the back, we had Taylor, uh, Ryan, and Michelle's actually up here now uh, for getting you all checked in. So this group is entire. Oh, and I want to give a shout out to Colton and Ray on the technology. So this group is run all by volunteers. So these are people that give their time to make this an awesome experience for you all. So I really appreciate their help. Um, once again, uh, in addition to the video, the slides will be available. So when you checked in, uh, we got your email address. So everybody that uh, got checked in will get a copy of the slides. So that should go out tomorrow or the next day at the latest um, for both uh, our presentation and Neil's presentation. Okay, disclaimer, so er everything presented here tonight is for educational purposes only. Um, not only what we present, but if you talk to anybody here, make sure you do your own due diligence and vet everything you learn. Um, there's a lot of good people here, but you still gotta make sure you, you do your own research. Um, who here has also been to the Real Estate Roundtable? So the Real Estate Roundtable is our regular club, is more focused on uh, wholesaling, flipping, single family, buy and hold, tax strategies, that kind of thing. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, uh, join us. That meets in the same location on the second and fourth Mondays of the month. Uh, it's kind of nice to balance out your education. Uh, we cover a lot more tax strategies and other kind of uh, real estate related things there as well. Uh, it's also uh, more of a community uh, atmosphere. So uh, kind of the idea when we invented the group was you know, to create an environment where you can get to know, like, and trust each other to foster um, investor partnerships. Uh, same thing we're trying to encourage here. So uh, once again, thank you for coming out. Uh, so we also teamed up with the Multifamily University. Uh, that was founded by Neil Bauer, our presenter tonight. Um, we, we teamed up because our philosophies around real estate align really well. We feel that the education around real estate should be free because if we want to have good investor partners, they have to understand how the mechanics of real estate investing works. Um, I, I was doing this one-on-one -on -one to investors all day long, and I said, hey, I can do this one-to-many. I can get this information out to more people in a format like a meetup. Neil does it through the Multifamily University website. Uh, if you haven't already signed up for this, um, it's multifamilyu.com. It's an entire platform of webinars, all sorts of 
uh, uh, multifamily related material and it's 100% free. So if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to check that out as well. Uh, with that being said, let's move on to Keegan. Thank you. Thank you. All right, how you guys doing? A lot of energy tonight, I like it. It must be all the new first timers. <laughs> all right, State of the Union. So if it's your first time here, this is uh, top down, up, oh, jump the gun. It's a 30,000 foot view of the US economy. So it's just kind of big picture, what's going on in America right now. So I like to always start off with talking about Trump. So I was just looking for a normal picture of Trump and this was on Google Images and I clicked on it and it turns out this is actually what he tweeted out before he announced he was going to put sanctions on Iran. So I don't know. He's just crazy. He, <laughs> he printed out a movie sized poster of this and put it on the, the table during a cabinet meeting. Just wild. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that, but I wanted to bring it up because I thought it was funny. All right. So Trump's favorite form of communication, Twitter. So this is uh, what he tweeted in response to the June jobs report. So overall, pretty strong report. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, so he pointed out, how's this work? All right, low inflation, strong jobs report. But then I wanted to bring this up. So they raised rates too soon, too often, and tightened, and yada yada. Our most difficult problem is not our competitors; it's the Federal Reserve. So. He's had some strong things to say about the Fed. Uh, he does not like what they're doing with interest rates. He wants them to cut them. He's been very vocal about that. So he's kind of going to war with the Fed, which is really interesting. So uh, here's the big takeaway from the June jobs report. So slight uptick in unemployment. So we came from 3.6 to 3.7, but overall we're still at all time lows. Um, I saw an interesting take that this was actually a positive because we added like 330,000 or 50,000 more uh, people to the job market. So they felt like it was a strong indication that people are entering the workforce. So um, take that for what you will. And then we added 225,000 jobs in June, which was 50,000 more than was expected and uh, well above what we had in May. So May was a uh, pretty scary month with, I think, about 70,000 jobs we added. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, clenched jobs coming into June. People were really wondering how this was going to pan out and if this was going to be, you know, another lackluster month and maybe the start of uh, some bad economic times. But, you know, pretty strong, pretty positive overall. So um, coming out of this last week, we had... Powell, the chairman of the Fed, he testified in front of the Senate that his um, yearly update on Fed monetary policy. So I want to update you guys on what he talked about because I think it's relevant to investors, especially if you're investing nationwide. So big thing he kept coming back to was inflation. Inflation actually dropped. So we were at about 1.9% uh, a couple months ago, which is right in line with their 2% target. And now it's dipped to 1.6. So he's hyper aware of inflation and does not want to get into a low inflation state. He wants to maintain as close to that 2% target as possible. That's his, it seemed like kind of his, one of his chief goals, I guess, with, with respect to the economy. So, and then he talked a lot about these economic cross currents. So his big concern globally was our trade war with China. Uh, he doesn't like what's going on because it's just causing a lot of uncertainty. Nobody seems to know how this is going to pan out. Uh, you know, we seem to make some progress and then we take a step back and then there's just causing an uncertainty. If you've been here before, I, I'm probably a broken record with uncertainty in China, but uh, it is what it is. That's his, his big concern. And then just an overall slowing of global economic growth. So that's a big concern for him um, as he looks forward and tries to adjust his monetary policy. Um, and then the last thing was overall decrease in business development. Uh, I guess he's seen some trends for that in the U.S., so that's also concerning to him. So, and then he talked about the debt ceiling. So he said, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, it seems like we're going to be raising it. I think it's like September uh, where they have to raise it. So 
If they don't raise the debt ceiling, he said it's going to cause unthinkable harm to the U.S. economy. So pretty strong words in terms of the debt ceiling. Obviously, everyone knows our national debt is out of control. We're going to also come back to that. But um, big takeaway, he seems like he's in favor of maintaining a very accom accommodative monetary policy. So they're meeting in about three weeks and word on the street is they're probably going to cut rates, which is interesting because we came into the year expecting another f potentially four rate raises was kind of the talk in December. And now here we are in July and possibly cutting the interest rate. So pretty interesting. All right, shifting gears, I want to talk about the student loan crisis because this is something that I see as a recurring topic of interest at meetups. And just for myself, I wanted to look into it because I didn't have student loans. Um, I volunteered to, you know, the government said, yeah, if, we'll pay for your college, you just got to go to war. So it <laughs> seemed like an easy, easy thing, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's where we are, I guess, right? All right, 44 million people have student debt in America right now. That's a pretty staggering number. That's a lot of people. Of those, the average debt is $30,000. So we've got all these college grads that we say, okay, time to start the race. By the way, we're going to tie your feet together before we hit, shoot the gun, right? So not an ideal place to be for a college grad that's starting their life to be already in debt, right, before they're even drawing their first paycheck. So the total is $1.5 trillion. It's tripled in the last like 15 years. And now it's just a staggering number. I don't know how you wrap your brain around that. I was trying to put that in context. What, what is something that it even costs 1.5 trillion? Where does that money go? So I looked at national debt was kind of where I ended up looking just to put it in context. So our national debt is coming in at about 21 trillion. So that represents about 7% of that. So that's a lot of debt. So when, then I started just looking at other countries' debt, because obviously I know that the U.S. is an outlier in terms of the amount of debt we have. Maybe not an outlier, but we got the most, you know? We're number one, USA, right? <laughs> so the way this chart works is the bigger the country, the more debt they have. So obviously the U.S. is the biggest, Japan's up there. But we have more debt than India as a nation, Brazil, Spain, Norway, all these countries, their national debt is less than what our college graduates owe. I thought that was just kind of crazy and puts into context. So diving in a little bit deeper, forbearance. So we have 2.6 million people with their loans in forbearance, representing about $111 billion of the pot. So what that means is they're either basically deferring that loan or just paying less than their minimum. So their balance is actually growing, which is kind of a scary thought because, you know, you borrow 50,000 and you could be paying it off for years and it could just be growing. And then maybe you wake up one day and you owe 100,000. So it's kind of crazy. And you can't bankrupt out of it. That's the crux of a lot of this. So defaults. $102 billion is currently in default, represents 5.1 million student loan debtors. So that's 11% of the student loan holders in America. Does anybody remember what the... Tick. Does anybody know what the mortgage default rate was in 2008? 4%? 40? I don't think it was 40. I think it was 4%, right? So this is at 11%, which is crazy. You add it in the forbearance, it's like 17%. So um, that's pretty telling of the hindrance that could have long term, right? So then you compound this with this idea of educational arbitrage. So what we're talking about is this diminishing ROI of the college degree. It's just not worth what it once was. We've kind of watered it down. Everybody is a college graduate now, and it's just not worth what it was. So this really kind of sums it up for me. Excuse me. 
Student loan debt on the left in blue, and then on the right is the median income for a bachelor's degree. So this goes from 2003 to 2012, so it's a little out of date, but I think it's still relevant. Um, yeah, that's just, it's a big gap. Chumps, right? <laughs> it's not a good investment. So this was another interesting stat. Uh, there was a study in 2015 that was pulling the demographics between Uber drivers and taxi drivers. And one of the things they pulled was education. So in 1970, 1% 1 of cab drivers had college education. Today, it's 40 to 50%. So imagine sending your kid to college and then they become an Uber driver. It's not really what you imagine when you get a college degree, right? Um, so something's going on here. So this idea of underemployment for new grads, 43 out of 100 are underemployed for their first job. So they're going to college and then they're working jobs that don't even require a college degree. Um, so it goes beyond supply and demand. Currently, we're projecting 19 million more graduates by 2020, and we're only making 7 million new jobs. So the problem's not getting better, it's just gonna continue to get worse until something changes. Um, and for us, what that means is that these people that are graduating with student debt are gonna be delayed entering the home ownership market. So maybe it's good for us as apartment investors, and maybe it's bad for the housing market as a whole. So uh, it makes it more difficult for them to save for a down payment. It's going to be more, it's potentially gonna affect their credit score, especially those 11% in default, right? Um, and throws off their debt to income ratio. So this chart shows, what does this show? This shows the overall Home ownership dropped between 2005 and 2014. So for the overall population, it dropped four points. For the 24 to 32 bracket, so the bracket most affected by student loans, it actually dropped nine points. And the Fed attributed a minimum of 2% of that directly to student loan debt, which means about 400,000 people of that bracket didn't enter the home ownership market. So you know, it's a big deal. This is, uh, for, I think this is the first link in the chain of why millennials are late to buy houses, you know. I think there's other things that go into that, but I think this is a, a big one, and it's probably going to get worse and cause problems down the road, so we'll see what happens. I don't know. And that's what I got for you. Cool. Awesome. So I don't know about you guys, but I like it when that stuff just gets spoon-fed to me so I don't have to do all that research. Um, so another thing I want to do, I want to introduce Colm here. He's got more of the inspirational side of, of how he's transitioning from you know, working for the man to getting into real estate investing. So here's Colm. Hi, my name's Colm. <laughs> I, I like to party. <laughs> so... Good movie. So, well, I'm super excited that uh, most of the people here are brand new because it directly uh, is related to the topic that I'm going to be talking about, which is uh, some tips for networking. Um, raise your hand if you're completely comfortable walking into a room where you don't know anybody. All right, you guys can go home. <laughs> so, um, all right, I'm putting the mic on my chin. All right, so the, the purpose of this conversation is for you guys to take away some tips about networking so that you feel more comfortable when you come into a situation like this. Again, I'm glad that there's 30 new people. How you doing? Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my story, how I transitioned from working for the man, like he said, into um, hopefully a full-time real estate investor with multiple revenue streams. I have, I have a handful of properties now, but it was only in the last couple of years. I'm fortunate that through education that they're doing well. And this is about maximizing your experience. And for me, I feel like the brightest light comes after the darkness. So uh, 2018 was a pretty rough year for me. Um, and I think the part of the problem is that most people get told to go to college, get a good degree, um, you know, work for a big corporation that has a lot of benefits, 
and uh, security. And what happens is we chase this check and we sacrifice our passions for security. And so I'm going through life. I've, I've done six, six, seven years, 100% commission sales. I'm doing really well. Um, and I got this never ending quota. You know, if, if any of you guys are in sales, you, you obviously know. It's like, what have you done for me lately, right? So, so my dad's cancer comes back. Oh, crap. Later in the year, I have heart failure. I actually had to go in for a life-saving heart condition. I was on four soccer teams. I was a collegiate soccer player, so you never expect that. You know, I was stud. And I realized through this months of depression, I was, you know, 30 years old, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd wake up, and I'd cry alone in my bed. I'd seriously cry. And um, I realized, like, man, i got to get out of this job. I, I, what do I like? I like, well... I already own a house, and they're already paying me rent. How can I build on that? And, um, and so I thought, well, I need to go into that industry because that's scalable, and that's probably a reason why a lot of you guys are coming out here. And so I thought, well, what are the skills that I have now that will help me grow in the real estate industry so that I can thrive? And I thought about what are my skills, what are my resources, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But in 2018... Um, 2019 and beyond, I feel like I'm thriving. I feel like I'm disciplined. I'm focused. I, I feel like a lot of the opportunities have come out of the real estate roundtable and uh, meeting people through Multifamily U and their content. And I realize that I have a lot of skills and resources available to me that you all have. Um, and so this, these were my skills. Um, but, but think about something that you may have that somebody else might really appreciate or want. Um, Michelle, what, can you think of something? I'm, I shouldn't put you on the spot, but can you think of a skill that you might have that somebody else might like? I'm friendly. Okay, she's friendly. So, <laughs> perfect. And uh, here you go. So, networking tip 101, don't have bad breath, right? So, always, always have a stick of gum on, right? Um, I went backwards. So um, I actually had a friend also in 2018. She got uh, cancer through chemo. She lost all her hair. So she said, hey, calm, I want all your hair. When you, can you grow it out? And I said, you know what? I'll grow it out for you. So I'm also growing my hair out for Janice, my first sales mentor, and to win a Thor lookalike contest this Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so <laughs> but uh, So studying YouTube videos... Newsletters, internet, there's a lot of content, multifamily you, um, seminars, coaching. These are all things that are available to all of us, and they're all things that were available to me in 2018 and in 2019. But the only real difference for me, with the exception of the people, was uh, the networking. You know, like in 2018, uh, at the beginning, I didn't have networking, I didn't have the real estate roundtable, I didn't have these groups to connect with people and find a mutual interest and maybe something that I can learn from them from. Now I do. And hopefully you guys too, too as well after we get through these skills. Uh, so the first, thing, the first thing I'd like to say is that don't call it networking, call it making friends. We're going to go through some keys, we're going to go through some skills. So the first thing, second thing, is check your ego at the door. I don't care if it's the CEO or the janitor. At the minimum, you should know what motivates them to go to work because there's probably something that you could learn from them. The second thing is look for the loneliest person. If there's groups and groups of people, look for the loneliest person. And if someone comes over and, and you know, they're going to be naturally attracted to your conversation, so engage them and get them involved in that conversation. The third thing is arm yourself with knowledge. The most, you know, money isn't valuable. It's the people that are valuable, right? It's the, the content. So by arming yourself with knowledge, you can feel more comfortable in an unfamiliar environment. So whether it's just a little bit of content that you can add value to something, to someone, it, it, it's actually pretty valuable and make you feel more comfortable, right? Uh, channel your curiosity. By channeling your curiosity, you can really focus on, and I would advise making a deeper connection with a handful of people rather than sprinkling 20, 30 conversations. Uh, the, the fifth thing is uh, set your goals before you go. 
So when I talk about setting your goals before you go, do you know what topic, how, how many people in here knew what topic other than Neil Bawa did they want to learn a little bit more about when they came here? You guys knew? All right. So um, th that's perfect. So you probably feel a little bit more comfortable because you know when you have a purpose and there's a sense of fulfillment. The next thing is use your, deep, your differences to deepen the conversation. You know, you might look at someone and they're a completely different age, completely different height, completely different body build, but at the same time, transform that anxiety into excitement to learn about somebody else. Again, making friends, not networking. So planning, this will also make you feel more comfortable because always have, what, maybe a pitch ready or a topic ready that you want to talk about and a business card. Do, how many people have their business cards today? Okay, so remember business cards don't make friends, right? Um, and then active listening. By actively listening, maintaining eye contact. Man, Colton's got some amazing eyes there. <laughs> um, it'll, it'll ask you and, and help you ask more relevant questions. And by strategic question, ask, question asking, you can deeper that conversation. So in sales, the goal was always to talk 20% of the time and listen 80% of the time. So with strategic question asking, I always felt like the conversation was a bowling ball and my questions were the bumper bars and where I wanted to get at the end was the pins. So through strategic questioning, I can get a lot deeper into that, that content. Uh, the fourth thing is focus on the other person. Has everybody heard about uh, WIIFM? What's in it for me? Everybody's tuned in to what's in it for me. No one really cares about your kids, but you're gonna talk about them, right? So, um, but by focusing on the other person, you'll actually learn something because you typically don't learn anything new talking about yourself, right? You know? So learn about them, ask more questions. Talk maybe 20% of the time, listen 80% of the time, and focus on adding value. If you add value, you can build a real relationship. And, and the last thing is follow up. So don't just hand out your business card and do, don't do anything, right? Get tea, get coffee, follow up, and uh, focus on, I've skipped it, but the three, three, the three C's of networking. I'm gonna keep it stupid simple, right? So conversation, you know, connection, collaboration. If you could just remember that, then you'll do well. Any questions? All right, cool. All right. Already? Oh, dang, I got my gum too. What are you trying to say? Um, so actually, what he just said, everything's true. I, we actually met him by coming to the rooms. We've you know, built a relationship over time, and I think that he brings something really valuable to our group. Uh, time and time again, people tell me I'm stuck in the corporate job. I hate it. How do I how do, I'll put it on my chin? Um, how do I transition from my corporate job into full-time real estate? And just in the last, I don't know, year or so that I've known Colm, he's making that transition. He's bought more rentals. You know, he's changing the way he, you know, he, he, you know forget about investing in the 401k, start putting it into your real estate assets. So uh, the last thing he said in 2019, take action. So I couldn't agree more. So speaking of action, um, I wanted to include a little bit of something uh, that's actionable that you can actually use. Um, you know, tonight's topic is on market trends. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Greater Sacramento Economic Council. They have an awesome website. Their primary mission is to bring uh, business and economic development to the Sacramento region. But by doing that, they create tons of research and uh, a very valuable tool that anybody can use. Uh, so some quick stats about Sacramento. I didn't know that um, we're in the top 25 metros based on population. So we're actually one of the biggest market areas in the United States, and they report all this data. So they, they track what's going on. And what really surprises me is like diversity. Um, you know, we rank really high as a, as a MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area, on many of the factors. Um, the links are on the slide, or you know, go to their website to dive deeper on these, but I just wanted to make, make you guys aware that this stuff exists. 
But even more important is they track mega regions. So Northern California, including the Bay Area and Sacramento region is a mega region. And on the stats for the mega region, we rank one or two in almost every one of these categories. You know, uh, pick, pick a category up there and we're number one. You know, annual US patents, a number of people that hold uh, BA or higher degrees, um, climate. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, in, in particularly in the multifamily world, we hear a lot about why people want to move or leave California, but there's also a lot of reasons why you want to stay in California. Uh, Mike Gobi's looking at me right now, and I love his strategy, live here, but invest elsewhere. So <laughs> I can get behind that strategy. But I encourage you to go to this website and, and check out some of this data. It's, it's really insightful on um, our own home region and what's going on in Northern California and why you may or may want to be here or why, uh, why business may want to be here. Um, but what I really wanted to point out is we want to add a new feature, Tools, Ticks, and Ninja Tricks. There are so many resources on the internet that uh, you can take advantage of. So this is their GIS on their website. So you can go in there and put in characteristics of property and it'll actually map it out for you in the Sacramento region. Uh, so I encourage you to go play around with this tool. Um, it, it's, it's full of tons of insights. Um, one thing that Neil talks about is the growth of progress. Uh, so it will give you some insight in which direction that the uh, growth is happening and, and where in the Sacramento region uh, might be uh, a great place to invest. Uh, Neil's going to get uh, more into the national scene, but I just wanted to make you aware of what's available for Sacramento region. So with that being said, I want to bring up another person that I think is another just inspiration. And the reason we do this is, you know, once again, both the Real Estate Roundtable and the Multifamily Group are, we're more of a community. And these are just community members that are doing great things. And I just wanted it, Taylor to share a little bit about her story. I don't have any slides. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor Mills. I am 21 and I've been in real estate for about eight years now. Yeah, so my dad started bringing me to events just like these when I was about 13. And at first, didn't like it. Everything went over my head. And then finally I was like, okay, I'm gonna try and learn one thing every meeting. And then after that, kept growing and growing and now I'm actually understanding things in these meetings. And I'm like, yes. Um, and so, it's gotten to point where like I'm coming to these and my dad's not and like I'm teaching him things and it's great. So just as long as you learn one thing, you're doing it right. And then, so now I'm basically helping my dad and he's, acquire, he's working to acquire three properties in Chicago. He's actually in Chicago right now looking at them. And so basically going from not knowing anything to now at 21 helping my dad acquire three properties hopefully and finding my own way to help with the business. So one thing I've been doing is creating Monte Carlo simulations, which basically allow us to look at a bunch of variables and then kind of predict, okay, we have this much confidence that this is gonna happen. And so with that, I've actually been able to help my dad pull in investors. And so at 21, I'm helping my dad finance deals and it's great. And so if, like, if I can do it at 21, you guys can do it in no time. So, yeah. T Taylor is so awesome. I met her at a, uh, like a three-day boot camp a friend of ours put on. And uh, just seeing her in the rooms and uh, seeing the growth that she's had as such a young person. Um, Kyle used to have that spot at our group, and he's moved on to Tennessee. He's actually participating in syndication. So I really applaud these young people. Uh, I just think back, you know, if I would have gotten involved in this stuff when I was 21, uh, I might just think where I'd been with my investing by now. Um, where they put the clicker? Um, so we're about to take a break, but the one thing I wanted to do before we move to a break, if we could all just scoot in, I want to get a, gr a group uh, photo of you all. Um, I think this is the highest record of attendees we've ever had at either the Real Estate Roundtable or the multifamily. So I want to applaud you all for coming out, and I would love to get you all with a photo with all your smiling faces. And Neil's here now. He had to make a few adjustments to his slide, so I'd like to have him come in here and get right in the middle of the, of the presentation, or the picture, rather. All right, so we're super excited to have Neil Bowen speak tonight. Um, I'm helping him with the Multifamily University, and we brought this uh, presentation to San Mateo about three weeks ago. It is absolutely fantastic. I'm thrilled to see it again. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Neil Bawa.
Thank you, Eric. It's great to be back in Sacramento. This is an incredible crowd. I have to say this. I speak at meetups and conferences all across the country, and you're very lucky to have this ecosystem here because most metros of the size of Sacramento don't have this kind of talent, this kind of ability. Before I move on, on to my presentation, I wanted to add a nugget to what one of the other presenters said. The, the worst thing that you could do when I finish my presentation is walk away. Because the great value here is not in this presentation, it's in the, the room, the people that are here. And you know, you, I've got my cards ready here, because when I'm done with this presentation, I'm going to rotate through this room. So here's some, some rules that I teach my students when I teach my multifamily boot camp. Number one, when you go to a meetup, right, as, as often as possible, make sure that you have five conversations, five strong conversations. That's what you want. I want five strong conversations, and I want five business cards associated with that. So giving your business card is actually not a useful activity. The only reason you give a business card is so you can ask for one. So it's very important that you learn that, that you got to basically take a card back. And one of the things that I'd like you to do that when you come the next time is bring a very small three by five notebook and make sure you bring a pen and make sure that the pen is tied to the notebook. Okay, this is, this is based on my experience because otherwise five minutes down the line, the, the pen's gonna be lost. And it's very, very important that you don't lose the pen because when people say, I don't have a card, you're gonna say, I have this notebook. Right, and you're gonna hand the notebook to them, and then you're gonna say something that's very important. You're gonna say, please write the email address in capital letters. Because that'll double the number of email addresses you have, because the chicken scratch is impossible to understand unless they're writing in capitals, right? So you're gonna double or triple the yield, I call it the yield from a meetup, when you bring that little notebook with the, with the little, um, you know, the, the pen or a pencil, right? Um, so you want to have those five conversations, and one of the things that I like to do is that the first appointment that I set for myself, you, my calendar's crazy, I, I set about 14, 15 appointments a day. The first appointment after I attend a meetup is the meetup follow-up, because I never want to wait beyond 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So if you're one of my five key meetings, I can bet you 100 bucks that tomorrow between 9 and 10, you're going to get a phone call or an email from me. And then I'm going to be following up. Because the heat for both you and the person on the other side of the interaction is going to keep dropping. They want to talk with you tomorrow morning. They may not want to talk with you a week from now. So all of this stuff is incredibly critical. And, and I can tell you this. You follow the five conversation formula. You go to three meetups a month. I guarantee in one year, you'll have more projects and partners than you know what to do with. One year, three weeks a, week, a month, five conversations. But you've got to have five strong conversations. And you must, at the 10-minute point, excuse yourself and move on. That's very hard for us to do. We keep yapping and having these 20-minute conversations, and then we never get to the five, right? So I usually do five minutes if I'm talking with, like Cameron. If Cameron and I are talking, I'm going to do five minutes. But if it's four people, then I'm going to go 10 minutes. And that's my limit, because one of these could be my five. And then I'm going to move on to the next section. It's incredibly important that you follow these rules, because you spend hours getting here, fighting through traffic, and now you're basically not getting that yield. So hopefully, you understand how much power there is to this formula. It's incredibly powerful. So back to me and the presentation. My name is Neil Bawa, and I'm a technologist that you know, I'm, I'm not like a whole bunch of people here. I haven't, I haven't done 100 loans. I haven't flipped 1,000 a, a homes. I'm a tech guy that fell into real estate by accident. My, in 2003, I was running a technology company with hundreds of employees. I was chief operations officer and the minor partner. The senior partner, the CEO, hated the fact that General Motors, our landlord, really hated our business because we were running a tech education business and our students were messing, their, messing up their carpets. So they didn't want us to, to renew our lease, which was up on July 4th, 2004. So nine months before, the landlord's supposed to give you notice. So they give us notice and they remind us that, oh, by the way, your clause says that if you're one day over your lease, it's $10,000.
per day. And we are going to enforce it, so make sure you're out by July 4th. So my boss basically comes to me, he's the CEO of the company, we have plenty of cash, and he comes to me and says, I'm sick of these bastards, that's what he said, you, his word, and we're not going to rent again. We are going to build our own campus. No, we're gonna buy our own campus. And I'm like, okay, that's great. You go off, I'll run the company, you go buy a campus. He comes back a week later and he's really excited and he says, I have put a deposit down of $50,000 on the perfect building, right? And I'm like, okay, show me pictures. You know what, I wanna know. It's, no, he's like, no, 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 no. It's two miles away, let's go and get in the car and let's go there. And I'm like, okay, there's something fishy about the way he's saying this, right? So we get in the car and he's refusing to tell me anything about this damn building and I'm like getting more and more nervous and we get there, now from the outside the building is really go good looking, it's awesome and like, oh wow, this is gonna be incredible. Imagine the branding that we're gonna get. And he opens the door and I step in to a space that's a rectangle, 27,000 square feet, 22 high foot high ceilings with just concrete floor, right? So I'm basically inside in an indoor football pitch. And I'm like, what, what, what is going on here, Paul? And he's like, this is our new campus. And I'm, I used a few F words there that I'm not gonna use here, but I was like, nine months left, nine months in two days, you're gonna turn this into a campus? Who's gonna do that? And he's like, you are. <laughs> and so after he woke me up from my fainting, I started working on that project, so I basically run the business from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and then start on my real estate shift, which went on until about two o'clock, every day, seven days a week, for nine straight months. I got a fantastic nine hours of sleep in those nine months, total, right? But I learned crazy amounts about construction. I learned everything about fire codes, and you know, densities, and egress, and you know, uh, heating and cooling and all kinds of crazy stuff that I'd never heard about and never wanted to learn about, right? And all of the nine months and two days, and by the way, I paid that $10,000 fee for one day, 4th of July, one day. And our crew, we had sleeping bags set up for our staff and managers so that we could get out of there and not pay another $10,000. So there was, that wasn't a very fun 4th of July for anyone. Um, and when we moved in, all of those nine months, every single day, I was bitching and moaning and complaining to my boss saying, how is this my job, right? But when that building was done, the branding that our business cost was so elevated, was so fantastic, that in a year and a half, we had pretty much you know, filled up the whole building, right? So we had gone from a business that needed 10,000 square feet of space at the General Motors building to maxing out the 27,000 square feet. And I realized that real estate had incredible value from a branding perspective, from owning the, the real estate. Also, the other thing that I was noticing was the building, that the, the business was depreciating massive amounts of money. We were a very profitable business, so the taxes that we were paying were incredible, and we were now beginning to get some depreciation benefits there. So, 2006 happens, right? So now, we run out of this building, and the building behind us, happens to be $4 million more, mostly because of our success, right? So that, that building is another one of those shell buildings, it's completely empty. And it happens to be 33,000 square feet, right? So the, the other one was 27. And because we had just spent $4 million buying the building and $2 million making the building, we didn't have enough cash. So I go to my boss and say, you know, I would love to buy that other building. And I'm hoping maybe he has like some rich uncle or somebody that can come in and buy this building. And he's like, yeah, let's go out and buy the building. And I'm like, but where's the money? And he says, well, you're going to gather it, right? My boss loved giving me these Mount Everest to climb. I think I, you know, every year was this new random Mount Everest. And he was like, you're going to do it. And I'm like, but I've never raised any money. Right? I haven't raised a cent in my life. And he's like, no, 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 you'll figure it out. So I go and talk to a bunch of people, and they eventually we realized that this building, which is 33,000 square feet, we had enough money to buy the whole building, but not to build it. And so we would need 13,000 square feet on day one. That was our immediate need, and which left 20,000 square feet. So what I did was I talked to my architect, and I said, can you chop this up into 10, 2,000 square foot suites, right? Five on each side of the corridor, right? And, and he did, and we, I came back with just a very basic floor plan. There were 10, nine doctors that I knew that were at, at the Washington Healthcare System in Fremont, California, that's where this building is. And so I know these doctors, they know me well, they know that our business is doing really great, some of them have actually tried to become partners with us. So I gather them into a room and I tell them, okay, here's the plan. I'm gonna buy this building, 
I'm gonna take this 13,000 square feet and each of you buy one of the suites, right? At 2,000 square feet each. And I'm thinking in my mind that if I get away from, if I walk away from this building, from this meeting with one single guy giving me his money, I'd be really, really happy, right? Because I've never done sales in my life. And so that was, there were $250,000 equity for each of those 10 suites. And I said, look, this is, this is great. You know, you, you get to have me as a tenant. As I grow, I'm going to keep taking all these suites back from you. And hopefully that's, you're done. You never have to basically worry about tenants again. And so all the doctors look at each other and they start having a conversation. I leave the room, they come back and every one of the nine doctors has his checkbooks out basically. And they're all giving me money. And they're all smiling in a very suspicious sort of way. So now I'm like, okay, you, what, what, what just happened here, right? I, what, what's happening here? So in my mind, I'm thinking like, I'm the greatest salesperson of all time. But at the same time, their funny smiles are telling me that that's not really the case. So today, and this is a multifamily group, so you guys probably know this, I was supposed to charge a 5% developer fee on a $9 million project, so that's $450,000 that I was supposed to charge these people, and do a 30-70 or a 20-80 split, which would have been another $2 million. That's what the doctors were used to. That's what they were used to. And because I didn't know any of these things, I didn't charge them any money. <laughs> and so the doctors got this incredible deal, and people are like, oh, that was a bad story. This is a great story. Within 20 months, I had built the building. Within 30 months, I had absorbed all 10 of the suites. And thanks to that second building and the, and the space that it gave us to grow our business, we exited at $55 million a few years later. Our business exited at 55 mil. So to me, it was a win, 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 win. Everybody won. I won, because by the way, one of those nine suites ended up being in my name. One of the doctors had to withdraw. And that's when I realized the power of real estate because I had a big fat technology salary, 300K plus, so I was paying 40, 50% in tax every year. And I noticed that that suite was knocking down my taxes from a depreciation perspective. So I was like, wow, this depreciation thing is awesome. I need to learn more about it, right? So I go and start learning and I, I start doing the same sort of thing that you guys are doing. Meetups weren't around back then, right? They just started, right? So there, were, there was no option to go to meetups. So I start basically researching on the internet and the timing is awesome. It's 2008, right? The sky is falling. Everybody hates real estate. And I'm like, no, real estate is good. Have you heard about depreciation? <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, what, what is wrong with this guy? So, so I go run around the place and I'm looking at all these different articles. And I come across this article in Zillow that says, here's a list of all the cities in the US that have fallen the most from their 2005 highs, right? So you see a whole bunch of cities in there. There's Phoenix and Orlando and Las Vegas and all these cities. But guess what? At the top of the list, the city that had depreciated the most happened to be in California. And it was a city called Madera, California, 20 miles north of Fresno, right? So me being a, a numbers guy, I'm a, I'm a geek, right? I'm a data scientist. I'm like, this is the best buying opportunity of all. I go immediately gather all the people in my family together and I tell them, you guys don't understand how good this is. I come out completely bruised from that meeting an hour later, my family's beating the shit out of me saying, you're an idiot. <laughs> Nobody invested anything. But then me being stubborn, the numbers made sense. So I run off to Madeira, California, and I go find a local builder. And I, I, I bring that builder to one of the homes that was on sale for $90,000. And I say, how much does it cost to build this home? Oh, he says, oh, easily $170,000. And I'm like, so how can it be a bad idea to be buying this home for $90,000 if it costs $170,000 to build? Why is my family trying to kill me for doing this? And he's like, because your family doesn't really understand the mathematics of real estate. This is a great buy. So guess what I do? You're only allowed to buy 10 homes, 10 single family homes as a person, correct? So a few months later, I owned 10 homes in Madeira, California. All of them in a, in a row, right? All of them four bedroom, brand new Kaufman and Broad homes. I've never regretted that decision. My family disowned me for the next two years until they figured out how profitable it was. And then a whole bunch of them went to Madeira and bought another 40 homes. So that ended up well for me. They never gave me any credit for it. They just went off to Madeira and did what I did. But, but what was interesting was those 10 homes really built a lot of confidence in me that I knew what I was doing because I was a numbers driven guy and the math worked, right? Even back then on day one, they were making me money. Now, as you can imagine, 
they, the value has gone up to $250,000, $260,000 each. And I've already in the last 10 years had rental profits of about $120,000 per home. Right Now the rents are up about 80% from what they were in 2008. So that ended up well. But you'd think my next step would be like, I would be like, okay, I, I'm going to take this and I'm going to scale this. And I did that in the exact worst possible way. So <clears throat> I, I start thinking that if I touch something, it's going to turn into gold. So I go off to Chicago, South Chicago, right? And I go out and do the same thing. I go out there and I look at all the same numbers that I looked at Madeira without looking at the neighborhood, right? I'm just looking at this, the numbers. It's like, this, this is a slam dunk. So I go out and buy 10 triplexes in my wife's name, right? And uh, <laughs> she almost divorced me. That, so it was, it was horrific because all those numbers, all those rent numbers were right. So, but the problem was the tenants would only pay about six months of the time and then they would move out. My eviction costs were 23% of my gross revenue. My maintenance costs were 37% of my gross revenue. So 60% of my revenue was going into these two areas before my mortgage. I was losing money like crazy, right? You can't imagine the bleed from 10 triplexes. It was crazy. All that money I had for coming in from Madeira, it was going directly to Chicago. Do not pass go, do not collect 200, go straight to Chicago. That's what was happening every single month. And I'm like, I have to do something about this. So one weekend I sit down and I say, what is the one thing that I can do? I can't really change the area. I can't change you know, these tenants. And so I decide I have to sell these properties, right? But first I have to fill them with good tenants. I don't want to sell a crap property to somebody. So the problem is only one in about 20 or 30 tenants was a quote unquote good tenant. And that's what my property manager after I buy lets me know. So I'm like, I have to find these tenants, these, these amazing tenants. They must exist, but I have to find them. And so I realized that to find those tenants, I had to generate for my 10 properties, 10,000 tenant leads. 10,000 tenant leads for 10 properties. So I'm like, okay, this is a mathematical problem. I'm a math guy. Let's figure out how to fix it. So I go to a Ukrainian hacker. <laughs> so I go to this guy in the Ukraine and I say, here's a list of the top 20 apartment and, and home listing, rent listing property, uh, you know, websites, Zillow, Trulia, rent.com, show me the rent. You know, here's a big list, right? I want you to go and figure out how to hack all of these websites so that I get like 10 or 20 or 30 listings instead of one but please don't inject any code, the FBI knows where I live. <laughs> so the guy actually, to his credit, over the next month, figured out things like um, Zillow. So if you put in your address, you can put a listing in there saying my home's available for rent. But then at the end of it, if you put in a pound and then a number, it thinks it's a different address. So I had pound one, pound two, pound 16, pound 44, pound 775, and now I had unlimited number of Zillow listings. So by doing this process and figuring out things like semicolons, dots, slashes, backslashes, we figured out how to hack all of those engines. And I was at 1,000 leads a month. And in 12 months, my properties were at 100% with good tenants. I was the only person in all of South Chicago with 10 properties with good tenants. Right? So things are really awesome and I'm learning all this great stuff and I'm like, now I got to teach all this stuff to other people. This is going to be amazing. Right? And so the opportunity arrived a few months later because on the day that I filled up my last property in 2010, I finally learned this amazing word called syndication. Right? Syndication is a process of buying a very large multifamily with a room full of investors that all put in 50 grand or 100 grand. And I'm like, whoa, this is really awesome. Right? I got to go invest a bunch of money here. So I, what I do is, I go back to Ukrainian hacker. So I'm like, there's this website, it's called the sec.whateverwhatever.org, and they list all of these SEC compliance syndications. Back then there was no crowdfunding. Crowdfunding only you know, started in 2013. So please don't hack the SEC's website, but write a scraper that basically clicks on every one of those links and grab, grab it to Excel. So he comes back the next day and he's got like all these syndicators. 
And so there's like hundreds of them. I deduplicate them. I figure out which ones are the best because a bunch of them are only done one project, right? So I eliminate those and I look at companies that are doing syndications. I make a list of 25. I start making phone calls. And six months later, I've invested in 13 of those projects, 1.3 million, right? And I'm like, this is the best decision of my life. I'm about to get 10% cash flow because they were all projecting 10% cash flow. So I'm like, okay, next month I'm gonna have a $10,000 check, right? No check arrives. Three months later, no check arrives. Six months later, no check has arrived. And I'm like, what the heck is going on here, right? So I start calling all of those guys and they're like, Neil, the properties that we bought, we bought at incredible prices. Because 2010 was the worst year for apartments, not 2008. Because apartments, everything, trails single family by 18 months. And you're gonna learn more about this in my presentation today, right? So it trails. So now we have apartments that are super duper cheap. And I look at their math and I go, you know, this price is incredible. We're gonna make truckloads of money. But what about cash flow today? And he says, okay, here's the problem, right? Our occupancy is at 80%. And so we're only able to pay our mortgage. So you have to be very, very patient. It's gonna be a year. We're gonna make truckloads of money. And I knew we, that they were right. The problem was I didn't want to wait for a year. I wanted my money now, right? So I, I start thinking about what am I going to do with this? And then I hit upon the, fire, the, the idea, Ukrainian hacker. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I go back to these 13 syndicators and I make an offer to them, which is, look, I gave you $100,000. I'm an investor. Therefore, there's no legal liability if me and my buddies in the Ukraine start marketing your properties using all these hacks I've found. So I start showing them all of these hacks and they're like, wow, this is really cool, right? So eight out of those 13 syndicators come back to me and say, yeah, you're an investor. Why don't you start you know, marketing? So now I'm running my technology company the day from eight to six and from six to 10, I am basically marketing apartment complexes throughout the United States in 2010. Long story short, six months later, I had $10,000 in cash flow. Right, so those properties went to 98% average. And then after that, me being me, I sent a very nasty email to the other five syndicators, letting them know what, what, what happened. Because there was a thank you email that came from several, several of these syndicators and I forwarded it to the other guys. And they came back to me and I'm, I'm like, um, well, I don't wanna say the exact words that I said to them, but I think you can figure out what they were. So to me, I realized that I had some skills, some really amazing skills that these these eight syndicators, their portfolio was two billion bucks. And they loved me. They thought that I was hot shit. And I was like, no, I just figured out how to do this one thing in multifamily. I don't know anything about it. I'm multifamily. And so they're like, okay, Neil, what do you want from us? And I'm like, okay, in two to three years, I'm going to sell my business. And when I'm done, I want to buy my own multifamilies, right? Not with you. I'll keep giving you money. You can keep, you know, the money that you give me, I can, I'll give back to you but I have other money coming from the sale of the business and I wanna buy my own multifamilies and I don't know enough. I've helped you. What if I teach everything that I did with Mr. Ukrainian Hacker? I show it to your staff. In return, you teach me everything you know about multifamily. Everything. Total disclosure. Every doc, every process, every system, every phone call. I get unrestricted access, not just to my property, but every other property. All eight of them said yes. And so now in 2011 and 2012, I attend 200, 200 property management calls. And they're like, this guy is crazy, right? We, we thought he would attend like one meeting and then get bored by all this really boring stuff. But they don't know how stubborn I am, right? So I go to all of these calls and I'm gathering this amazing information. And I'm checking all the blogs and I'm reading all the books and none of the stuff that they're telling me is in the books. None of this stuff is even in the courses because in multifamily, nobody ever built a true university. There's no bachelor's degree in multifamily. There's no associate's degree in multifamily. Nobody had really created a set of systems. Everybody had created homegrown systems. So now I have access to these eight companies that are two billion bucks that have these amazing, amazing systems, but they're all different from each other. So this particular syndicator is awesome at lipstick on a pig. So he makes his property on the outside looks very nice. This one's really good at filling it up. This one's really good at rehab. And the next one's really good at selling it at the, at the right time. So they're all teaching me all these different processes. And I'm like, I don't think anybody else in the US has access to all this stuff. 
because nobody has ever disclosed this information. And many of them were okay with me sharing some of that information as long as I didn't use their logos. So I'm like, how the heck am I going to remember all this stuff? My company still has two years to go. All this stuff is insanely good. I have to somehow retain it for two years. So I'm running around my house thinking, I have to figure out how to do this. And eventually, I come across this wonderful word, meetup, right? So I go and open a meetup, right? Many, many, many years before Eric thought of the idea. You copycat, you, right? So I open this meetup in the San Francisco Bay Area and I say, I am going to start teaching all this stuff that I'm learning at my own meetups. And guess where the meetup was? Inside that building that I built, right? Because I had all these big classrooms. And I was like, finally, I get to use the biggest classroom that I built in this building for a real estate meetup. So I start teaching at the meetup and people are coming up to me and starting to talk with me and they're like, I'd like to invest with you. I'm like, no, 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 you don't realize you're inside my technology business right now. This is what I do. I don't, I don't do real estate. And they're like, why are you teaching real estate? It's like, because I'm learning all this cool stuff from all these syndicators. And they're like, wow. So whenever the hell it is that you sell this business and go into real estate, we'd like to invest with you. So I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm going to start writing names down, right? So I start writing down names of people every single meetup. And by the time, July 1st, 2013, I sell my business, I have a list of 200 investors. And so my first project in multifamily on my own, other than those Chicago stuff, which was sold by now, was a 237 unit. And then from there on, things kept moving up. I've done projects that are 355 units. I've done projects that are 50 plus million dollars and today we have, I have 1,200 investors, 1,200 investors that are registered with me. We just did a project called Coyote Creek, and you'll get to see a picture of it today. And uh, we basically have investors that gave us a million dollars per day once that project was announced. A lot of this is really about, the story is really about persistence. The story is really about understanding the opportunities. It's also important to know that Ukrainian ha hackers are really awesome people. So that's part of my story, and we'll talk more about that. But the other part of my story that I didn't get the time to mention is, I am very fanatically tied to data. I'm insanely tied to data, and today I'm gonna tell you about the trends in the United States and why, why multifamily is such an incredible asset class. And for those of you that are thinking, I don't wanna invest in multifamily, don't worry. To me, it's not multifamily. It's rentals. So today, everything that I've said, every time I, the word multifamily or apartment comes out of my mouth, if you don't like multifamily, replace it with the word rentals, and you'll be fine, all right? We're gonna start with the stuff that affects everything that nobody really thinks about. The economy, jobs, inflation, unemployment, consumer confidence. We're gonna talk about the interest rate forecast. We're gonna talk about the single family forecast, and we're gonna talk about Sacramento as well. And then we're gonna do the multifamily forecast, and then I'm gonna do something, given that this is now a multifamily group, I'm gonna tell the story of apartments in 10 very interesting charts, right? I bet you when you're done with those 10, you will think differently about apartments. I finish my presentation by basically giving you lists. These lists are not multifamily lists. In fact, I, well, they're single family lists and multifamily lists, they're separate. These are the best places in America to invest in and they include Californian cities. Luckily, both sides include Californian cities. And then I finish my presentation by sticking my neck out, I do this every year, and I pick one underperforming city, and then I pick the best city in America to invest in, whether you, doesn't matter if you're in single family or multifamily. So that's the end of that presentation. Luckily, they did a disclaimer, so I don't need to do them again. You know about me now. Those are some of my buildings, by the way. I love building brand new buildings, but there's just not enough of those projects. Like this one here is a single investor. He's, he's a surgeon for the San Jose Sharks. And I built this $10 million building for him. Oops. I got to fix something here because this presentation has the same problem. So give me 30 seconds. Where's the mouse? Is that the mouse? Okay, hang on. And transitions and on mouse click. There we go, save. Where's the save button file, save. All right, I don't want it running away from me. So the sort of buildings that I build, 
The ones that I love the most are ones like on the top left, that's Art City Center. But the ones that make the most amount of money are actually older buildings. So this one is Park Canyon, and I, this is about 20 miles from Chattanooga. Um, it's in Georgia, but it serves the Chattanooga metro. So what I found is that the older buildings actually more, make more money. The new buildings only make huge amounts of money in certain parts of the US. And I'm going to give you those parts of the US today. You don't have to invest with me. You can just run off there and make crazy amounts of money yourself. Let's start at the beginning, the economy, the demographic trends for 2019. Here's the rule of thumb. If you're looking to make big decisions in real estate, if you're looking to invest a lot of money in real estate, you want the United States GDP. Doesn't matter if you know what, what that is, gross domestic product. If, even if you don't understand it, here's all you need to understand. For real estate to keep going up, the United States GDP needs to be 2%. 2%. And you need to keep track of that. I'm going to give you five or six things that you have to keep track of. And this is the first one, right? Has nothing to do with real estate and has everything to do with real estate. Well, the good news is if I look at GDP for the US, um, so the last quarter, the first quarter of the year was at 3.1%. Usually the first quarter is higher than other quarters. And then the second quarter is expected to be at 1.8. So I take those two together and I put it together, that's 4.9 and I divide by two and that's 2.45. So on the GDP number, we're doing really well. And if you look at the last seven or eight years, there hasn't been a nine month or three quarter time when that number has been below 2%. And that's the reason why real estate only goes in one direction. The other number that I want you to understand is something known as consumer confidence. GDP is for the geeks, the nerds, people like me, right? Consumer confidence is for everybody else because how we feel about our lives affects how we buy big ticket items. People will only buy homes and people will only buy cars when they feel good. And the number that you have to look for if you're investing in real estate is 100. You want consumer confidence levels to be above the 100% line, and it sort of crossed that here in about 14, right? So starting 14, that number has been continuously going up. As of today, it's at 134. So keep an eye on that. All of this stuff is easy to Google. Shouldn't take you more than one minute, and once you've done it once, bookmark it. Bookmark it in your browser. You can click back on it the next day and go back at it. You don't want the consumer. It's still okay to invest when the consumer confidence level is 80 to 100. But if it falls below 80, stop taking risks. Stop taking risks. Basically, get rid of every risky asset that you have immediately. Because bad things are about to happen. Tied back to that is employment growth. Employment growth in the U.S. needs to be at 100,000 jobs a month to support real estate. Whenever, let's say, let's say we get a quarter with $50,000 jobs each, you're gonna start noticing immediately a softness developing in the, in the real estate market. It, it happens within a quarter, it happens very, very quickly, so keep this number in mind. The good news is, we lost 8.7 million jobs in the Great Depression, but we've gained back almost 21 million jobs as of last month. And we've now had 107 months of continuous job creation. This is the single longest expansion in US history. And it's, it may go on for very long for reasons that we can separately talk about for those of you that are interested in macroeconomics. Here's another thing that I like to see. This is a very easily available chart from the internet, labor force shortage in the US. Just type that in, you'll see the chart. What I don't want you to see is here, you want the orange line, which is unemployed, to be moving downwards, closer to the blue line, and you want this blue line, which is job openings, to be moving up. This is very unusual. What just happened, happens very rarely, when the number of jobs in the US are actually higher than the number of people that are unemployed. This happens extremely rarely, so don't expect this. What I want you to not see is that this orange line turns back up, and this blue line turns back down. Because if that happens six months from now, all of those brokers that are now saying, the market is hot, are going to say, the market is shit. That's what's gonna happen, right? Six to nine months from now, it's going to happen because this is what's driving everything. 
And then this chart is actually, I'm going to skip this one simply because I, I don't have time. It's, not, it, it's a very difficult chart. So skip, there we go. The one that's more important is inflation. Inflation is this multi-headed hydra that ends all of our expansions. Recessions are caused when inflation spikes, right? This is a busy chart. Stop reading the stuff on the left. It doesn't matter. What matters here is inflation spikes up, recession, spikes, recession, spikes, recession. And here, we were going in the wrong direction. We were at three. And at four, you almost always hit a recession. But here's the good news. In June 2018, inflation flattened out and started going down. So now it's dropped back to 2%. Amazingly, despite all of my forecasts about a recession, none of, it, none of those forecasts have been right. All of them have been wrong so far because it was moving up in a very nice way and then plateaued. Some of it had to do with the trade war or discussions about the trade war. So oddly enough, that seems to have prevented a recession even other than, you know, most people think it's going to cause a recession, but that's not what really happened. We have a very complex economy. So you look at that, we are in this Goldilocks zone right now, where inflation is under 2%, even with unemployment under 4%. It's a mind-blowingly Goldilocks zone in the US right now. And understand that this is an incredible opportunity. Now, keep in mind, the number you want to be careful about with inflation is 3.5%. So get your bookmarks. Inflation charts are super easy, easy to find. And make sure that inflation doesn't cross 3.5%. If it does, start watching it very carefully, because once it hits four, you're almost immediately in a recession in the US. Sometimes it takes a few months, but 4% recession is a very clear, 4% uh, inflation is, is a precursor to a big recession. Bottom line, our economy is in a crazy shape, right? The US economy might be a pig, but we are the best looking pig in the whole damn pigsty. We are the best, most gorgeous, biggest pig in that pigsty, and nothing comes close. Pick any economy in Europe, pick any economy in Asia, and then actually look at our basic metrics, the ones that I just showed you, and compare it with theirs, we're gonna crush them. We're not gonna beat them, we are going to demolish them. That's how good the US economy is right now. I know people you know, talk about bad news, but for the moment, there isn't any. I've done this presentation five straight years, and this is the best situation that I've seen, right? So obviously there's risks, there's the trade war, there's uh, immigration, which, which particularly affects California, right? So California is losing crazy amounts of population to other states. And the only thing that keeps us population positive is inward immigration, which comes in from Mexico, India, and China. Well, unfortunately, Last year, in 2018, for the first time, that immigration was extraordinarily low, and this year it appears to be negative, which means people from, you know, that came in from India, China, and Mexico are leaving California. They're not leaving the U.S., they're leaving our state. So lots of potential problems, but for the moment, immigration doesn't appear to be hurting the U.S. as much as most people, including me, thought it would. Wages are rising, which is awesome. You don't want them to rise at 4%. That would cause inflation spikes, but they're rising at just the right amount. And then here's a big one, right? The recession, the massive recession that we had in the late 70s, early 80s was caused by an oil shock. Well, the United States cannot any longer experience oil shocks. We are the largest oil producer in the world. And we still have room to, to, to do more. So if the price of oil goes up above 70, we can actually start pumping out a lot more than we're pumping out right now, because some of that oil is only fundamentally viable at $75, $80 a barrel. So th the moment the price of oil goes up, we open up a bunch of wells that we've already drilled. A few weeks later, we're pumping so much oil that we bring the price down. So we are now the swing producer of the world, which means that it's practically impossible for an oil shock to happen. And guess what? If it does happen, all that's happening is the US is not giving money to Saudi. It's Californians giving money to Texans, right? Which may not be good from your point of view, but it's really good for the US economy. We're moving money from one state to another, not from one country to another. So that's, that's good news. And so we're in a very, very good ray, a good, good place. But one of the things that last year was a huge, huge discussion in all of these meetups was inflation. Oh, I'm sorry, interest rates, right? Because 
The big question was, will the Federal Reserve end the real estate party? Well, the good news is that didn't happen either. Remember when inflation turned down? Well, that forced the Federal Reserve to change what they were going to do because the Fed, their mandate is to keep inflation in that 2% range. And because it turned down so sharply, they couldn't raise interest rates. In fact, now it's, there's almost a guarantee that we're about to cut interest rates. At this point, 98% of people polled thing that the next Fed meeting is an interest rate cut. So interest rates are at crazy low levels, which is awesome for real estate. And what's nice is that the expectations from the two big dogs, the two big dogs are Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, they both think that not only are rates low, they both think they're gonna stay low for the next year and a half. So anybody in this room who thinks that inflation, or sorry, interest rates are a risk, interest rate hikes are a risk, please don't worry about that. At this point, no one thinks that, absolutely no one. Freddie Mac, 4.5% from 4.3, and by the way, this, this is the average, right? You, if you know how to use the internet, bankrate.com, you can get rates much lower than 4.3%. So these are both awesome numbers, but this is the end of next year. Fannie Mae's even better. They think that they're gonna be at 4.2, and they're gonna stay there until the end of 2020. Interest rates are a huge thumbs up, a double thumbs up for real estate for the next year and a half. But that sounded like too much good news. I was just front-loading it before I started, you know, the, getting to the bad news. And so bad, some of the bad news starts here. The single-family forecast for 2019 and 2020 is, you, you can see there from the picture, right? It's, it's very cloudy. It's very muddy. There's challenges. And we're going to talk about California as well. So here's a chart. Here's the part that's most important. So after seven straight years, U.S. home price, prices actually decreased. The country's home prices decreased by 0.1%. What's remarkable is California's home prices in the last 12% also decreased by 0.1%. This is an unusual number, but both California and the U.S. were at basically flat for the last 12 months. Now these numbers, depending on whether it's summer or winter, go up quite a bit. There's a, there's a huge swing between seasons. But the last 12 months, basically they're not going up, they're not going down. And the other number that we care about, that we really focus on, is how many, what's the volume, right? Because if the volume drops a lot, people get nervous and they start cutting their prices. And that eventually leads to the prices dropping. So we look at the volume drop, it's been a drop so far, the volume's dropped by 4%. Now what I want you to do, this is another one for those that are in the single family business in Sacramento, you've had a metro that's gone up a lot, right? So it's, it's, it's an area that you have to be concerned about. This number, if it hits 10%, right? So you have to Google something like single family home sales volume Sacramento, single family home sales volume Sacramento, or whatever city you're from. And if that number, you, when you're reading the article, if it says, 10% down, you're going to see price cuts coming. So home sales declines or volume declines are a precursor to actual pricing declines. And it's got to be 10%. And if it stays at that 4 and 5%, I wouldn't worry. But if it gets to 10, I'd sell whatever I have at that point because it, it's going to decline. Now let's take a look at California. Those, those numbers were for the US. If you look at California's market, the um, UCLA Anderson forecast that came out in March this year says, California's housing market is cooling, job growth is strong, the economy is strong, but weakness is apparent in the state's housing market and it's likely to cool further. And you might say, but Neil, you told me that if the economy is strong and job growth is strong, real estate is great. But California has a special problem. If you read the whole report, it talks about it. California has the A word problem, affordability. California's affordability is insanely low, right? No other place in the US comes close, except maybe Manhattan, right? Nothing comes close to that. And because of the affordability problems, the market is cooling, even though the economy is really, really strong. And so here, they're talking about the fact that prices are actually dropping in many major markets in the Golden State. 
SoCal's SF Bay Area home sales fell to an 11-year low in January. That's not, that's not pricing, that's volume, right? And then prices have declined both in the Bay Area for eight consecutive months, and in Southern California, they've fallen for six consecutive months. So that's, that over there is, again, sales volume. We're not seeing prices drop across the board yet, but they could very easily happen because volumes are falling and have been falling for six to eight months. Having said all of that, I actually have a contrarian view of California. So while this report basically thinks that California pricing is going to be slightly negative in the next 12 to 24 months, I believe it's going to be slightly positive because I don't think that the impact of the San Francisco Bay Area's IPOs is being fully factored in. They're factoring in a little bit, but I think that they're giving, not giving it enough credit. So I think your California market, which is going to mirror the Sacramento market, could go up by 2 to 3% a year. Now in California, 2 to 3% a year is a horrible number because you guys don't make any cash flow. So you want to basically see you know, 9, 10, 11% because that's how you make your money. You only make it on the appreciation side, not on the cash flow side. Well, good or bad, that's what the number is going to look like. You're going to get 2 to 3% appreciation but there's some new good news coming up on the rental side, on the rent growth side, there's some good news coming up. So we'll take a look at that. So for the country, a positive, a slightly positive forecast. Last year was much higher, five, six, 7% growth, depending upon what state you were in. This year, we're cutting that in, in, in more than half, right? So you average this out, it's about 3% growth across the US. So that's what you're going to be seeing. But price reduction in the US, is likely to only happen in California and Puerto Rico, and only in parts of California, though it's likely to happen everywhere in Puerto Rico. So I gave you the bottom lines already, so I'm gonna skip past. Let's go to multifamily, the multifamily forecast for 2019. I was one of those gloom doom guys when I did this presentation a year ago. I thought that we were, we had too much new construction coming in I thought that the rents would plateau. I, I wasn't talking about them falling, but they would plateau. But that's not what happened. So multifamily actually posted an exceptional, another exceptional year in 2018, and we're about to learn why. And it did it for both appreciation and income. So it was a phenomenal year for anybody that was holding real estate. So I was really thrilled to be holding 2,000 units of, of multifamily through 2018. It was a phenomenal year for us. Appreciation, income growth, phenomenal. And the reason for that is really because most analysts in the US are believing that something new has happened. Multifamily has always been about necessity. Apartments have always been about people have no other choice. Here's what's changing in the US. Every year, more people in America are living in apartments by choice. And that number is growing extremely rapidly, extremely rapidly, and there's a number of reasons for that. So let's take a look at some of those. I'm gonna skip past this video just so that we, we um, stay on track here. So here's my story of apartments. This is gonna explain some of the, the, the interesting things that you're seeing there in the last year. We've got single family home sales falling and multifamily posting exceptional, incredible numbers that anybody would love if they were, they were in, the, in the multifamily area. Why is that happening seven to eight years into this cycle, given apartments have gone up you know, 60 or 70% across the US? There are lots of big reasons. Let's take a look at them. My first chart is not a chart. It's actually numbers. There's five super important numbers that you need to understand. 10 million is my first number, 10 million is the staggering number of new renter households in the last 10 years. The country has created 1 million new renter households per year for 10 straight years. The numbers before 2008, a third of that. So we've tripled the number of renter households that we've created since 2008. It's a crazy number. And you might think, well, that's all done. Now that the economy is at 3.8%, nobody wants to rent. Everybody's going to buy homes, right? This number is not going to go up. Well, it's still estimated at 500,000, so half that number for the next five or six years. 
And we're only building about 300,000 units at peak. And that peak's gone now. 2019, it was not the peak for multifamily. 2018 was the peak for new construction because now the costs have gone up on us quite a bit. And we're only building 300,000 units a year when our demand is 500,000. And remember, we already have that massive shortfall on the left, 10 million. This number is a sad number. The single population in the US rose by 15 million above married population in the past 10 years. We've always had a massive divorce problem in this country. Now we've got a problem that is potentially even more depressing, and that is the number of people that do not want to get married at all is spiking, right? So the millennial generation seems to be especially averse to getting married. And so we've got all these singles, and singles like renting, right? People that get married eventually end up buying single family homes. So we've got that challenge. Here's another challenge. I'm not going to spend much time on it because one of the other presenters covered it much better than I can. Student loan debt. It's at 1.5 trillion. It was at 200 billion in 2003. So imagine student loan debt for the whole country has gone up seven and a half times in 16 years. Seven and a half times, right? And so everyone's like, this is a bubble and it's going to burst. How many people here think that student housing is a bubble? All right. I have news for you. It's not. The definition of a bubble is that you can prick something in it and burst it, correct? Student housing is not a bubble because it cannot burst. All of the loans are due to the federal government, and you cannot get rid of them by filing bankruptcy. The government is infinitely patient and will keep coming after your money. <laughs> they truly are, right? So they're the worst lender to have. And so at this point, more than 1.4 trillion of that is the federal government. Student housing is not a bubble. Student housing is a tragedy. Because those people that are coming out, they, student loan is going at 6% a year with an economy that's only inflating at 1.5% a year, so four times faster. The class of 27 nationwide, $39,000 plus interest in debt. The class of California, over $100,000. They can't buy homes. They're pushing that decision back, and in many cases, they're never going to get there. Understand these numbers. They're highly depressing numbers. Now for a moment, take off your community hat and put on your real estate investor hat. You couldn't find five numbers better than these if you were a real estate investor. So why did, all, why did all of this stuff happen, right? Why did we get into these problems? Well, this chart starts to explain it. And there's two charts, this one and the next one, which really explains this. And there's an anomaly in this chart that people in real estate recognize immediately. So this is, of course, the Great Recession, right? Right here. So vacancy spiked up, and then it went down. That orange bar is vacancy. This is multifamily construction. We're only looking at multifamily here, not single family. And so here... When we started building the largest amount of incoming supply in multifamily in the history of this country, 300,000, 300,000, 300,000, 300,000 units, everybody, including myself, was like, the sky is going to fall down as soon as all these units come online, and our vacancy is going to go up, right? It's going to go up like crazy, because that's what happens every time you build a lot of apartments. Vacancy goes up, because all those Class A apartments come online, people jump to those, because they're giving you two or three months off, and now these Class Bs and Cs are empty. Nothing like that happened. Nothing like that happened. For the first time, if you look at the last hundred years, when we built a bunch of new apartments, vacancy went down. Why did that happen? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Every economist predicted it's going to go in the other direction. Well, that's because of a lot of reasons, and the first one's here at this chart. Now, this chart is showing single-family and multifamily. That's, that's multifamily up there, the little bars. This is single-family, right? So you can see which market is bigger. Single-family is obviously bigger. And so here's what happened. Do, after the crash, this, the demand recovered, the number of households spiked back up as people started getting jobs. But the construction, single and multifamily, remained anemic for a long, long time. And so we developed this gap. You see this gap? 
This gap is millions and millions and millions of household that neither single family addressed nor multifamily. And the gap for one straight years came back into equilibrium. We're in a good place here. And now the millennials are into their prime buying years. I said that they're buying less. I didn't say they weren't buying. And because they're in their prime years, we're now building a new gap. And we're going to figure out what this gap has really meant for people in this country. The other thing that's happening is that rents are cheaper than owning. So in 2006, it made no sense to buy anything because it cost $742 adjusting for taxes and everything else than, than, than um, renting. And then in 2012, it made no sense whatsoever to rent at all because it cost the exam say, exact same to buy or to rent, right? So this was a great time to be buying. But now, as you can see, the gap's developing again in favor of multifamily. It's moving in the favor of multifamily. Now, this one's interesting for those of you that are very interested in multifamily, and you're wondering, do I want to buy class A? Do I want to buy B? Do I want to buy C? Right? What's the right thing to buy? C is workforce housing, the guy that works for Starbucks, the guy that's driving a bus. He's in a class C property. So here's what I want to show you. Here's what happened. So as you can imagine, Class C had a really, really bad year in 2009. One bad year, just one, right? The rest of the years were okay. They were at 6%. And then as time went on, something weird happened, something that hadn't happened in previous uh, recoveries. In re after, when the recovery starts, people generally want to go and live in a better place, right? They get a raise, right? They get, they, they're more sure of their job. So they go to a B, and then they move up to an A, and then they go up by a single family. So what normally happens is when there's a recovery, this and this bar start to go downwards in vacancy. And the, the, the C bar eventually gets to this point and just sort of muddles along, doesn't really do anything. But this time, the C vacancy kept going down seven years into a recovery. It's still going down. It's the lowest ever. The reason this is happening is this. America had this middle class. There were 100 million people. And now what's happening is 5 million of them are moving towards the rich side. And 95 of them are moving away from the middle class towards the almost poor side. And they simply can't afford to live anywhere else other than the class C. That is the only explanation. And it's really, really sad for our country, but we're not politicians here. It's their job to fix this problem, not ours. We just have to look at that and understand the opportunity. So today, it makes incredible sense to buy Class C because the number of people that can afford the blue line, the number of people that can afford the orange line is falling, even though the country is, is, is in a recovery. It's a crazy opportunity. And if you can be a landlord and buy one of these C properties, right? You don't have to you know, buy a 50-unit multifamily. You can buy a duplex. You can buy a quadplex. That number is going to stay extraordinarily low. Now, keep in mind, if there's a recession, exactly this will happen. But the good news is the recovery will be quick. 2008 was not a recession. It was a depression. It was a depression. But even then, if you skip just a couple years, you notice these numbers are very healthy. <laughs> The other thing that's happening is, on the Class C side, on the lower end side, we call it workforce housing, something odd happened. Once the recovery takes hold, the Class C rent growth in all previous recessions has been lower. Why? Once again, people want to now buy better places. They want to go to a B. They want to go to an A. But this time, it's different. This time, it is different. Seven years into the recovery, all of these numbers, by the way, left to right, except for maybe this little piece here, all of these numbers are phenomenal. All of them are higher than the long-term trend. See this? This is a long-term trend, 2% growth in rents. So, so far, the cycle has been incredible, except for Class A just for this one year, and then it recovered again, right? But you look at Class C rent growth, these numbers are phenomenal. Here's what I want you to write down for Class C rents, okay? If you're getting 2% rent growth every year, you're going to do fine. And I know in California, 2% is a horrible number, but please, humor me. 2% is a good number. 3%, you're super excited. You're really, really happy with 3% annualized rent growth. Every year, you get to increase your rents by 3%. 4%, 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%, 11%, 12%, 13%, 14%, 15%, 16%, 17%, 18%, 19%, 20%, 
4%, you're buying champagne bottles. 5%, you're doing the naked dance on the street with a champagne bottle, right? And I'm gonna show you the cities in the US where you can do the naked dance with a champagne bottle because there's so many of them. What's amazing is, if you were a classy landlord, the entire country was above 6% for an entire year. Nowhere in history have we an example of anything like that happening. It's such a titanic shift in America that most people simply didn't notice, right? And even when they went down, this, this is all the new construction, right? You can see the new construction came in right here in this, you know, two years. So prices went down, but they were still very, very strong. So this year, we're still averaging 3.3, 3.4% in Class C. You know what that means? That's an average. There's metros like South Chicago, they're not seeing any increase in, in, in um, rents, which means that there's plenty of metros in the US where people are doing the naked dance, hopefully on the weekends, right? So amazing numbers are happening everywhere across the US. And the big reason for that is, in the 1975, when we built brand new apartment complexes in this country, 20% of the people that were the median renters could just afford to pay for them, 20%. That number last year was 2%. Only 2% of our renters, our median renters, can afford to pay for all this new housing that's coming in. And you're like, so Neil, why is anybody making new housing? Shouldn't they make other sorts of housing? Well, the answer is, for a developer, the, the difference between making a Class A housing and a Class B housing is so small that it makes no sense for them to do it. And it's almost impossible to make Class B housing anymore. Nobody's ever made Class C, because Class C is basically older buildings that used to be A's and B's, you know, a long time ago, right? So nobody builds it. But you can build Class B housing. But today, almost nobody can build it because the cost of construction in this country has gone mad. It has gone absolutely 100% bonkers, and we're gonna see why in just a moment. And it's happened despite the fact that apartments are getting smaller. So the orange line shows you that apartments are slowly shrinking in size. As we build new apartments, we're building them smaller and smaller. In San Francisco, they're building them in shoe boxes, right? So you see these new micro units, right? Micro unit is just a name for, we give you a hotel room and we call it an apartment because it has a kitchen on the side, right? Well, yeah, this, this is exactly what's happening, man. It's, it's crazy. And I think it's gonna happen more because there's actually some benefits of living in those micro units over older buildings. We're gonna see more of those micro units. So apartments are getting smaller, but it isn't helping. Why? Here's the key graph. Imagine how America built New York, right? It took us 120 years to build New York as it stands today. Now, look at the map of the world and imagine like a SimCity game, a new New York is plopping down, fully formed, in a, somewhere in China every three months. They're building four New Yorks every year. Four of them. It took us 100 plus years to build this. They're doing four times a year, right? China's building, uh, India's building two New Yorks a year. They're no longer e interested in subsidizing our economy blindly. They're funneling their money into their own growth. And when they're doing that, everything that we buy from them from construction is becoming crazy expensive. The steel, the concrete, we don't buy wood from them anymore. We have our you know, neighbors in the north to thank for that but we buy everything else for construction from places like China, and it's getting crazy expensive. In 1992, it cost $40,000 to build an apartment. One apartment, average size, 40,000. Today, we're at 110. So that cost has basically tripled. Basically, it's running at three times inflation. So if inflation is 2%, it's costing us 6% a year to go up in construction costs. So we have this massive, insane situation in our country where we can't build more, whether it's single family or multifamily, right? We just don't have the ability to build more because nobody can actually afford what we're building, whether it's multifamily or single family, you can't afford it. But we need it. The country still needs more spacing. So is there a solution? Heck no. If there was a solution, I wouldn't be so excited. 
There is no solution at this point. Maybe in 20 or 30 years, we'll figure it out. Maybe it's 3D printing. Maybe it's, you know, people living in containers. I don't know what it is, right? But at the moment, there is no viable solution. People who talk about tiny homes being the solution don't know what they're talking about. Look at the number of tiny homes built in the United States in the last year. It was horrifically low because nobody wants them. No city wants them. No city will approve one of those things, right? Every city does one token project to show everybody that they have tiny homes, like San Francisco has one, right? And that's just for show. We need 10 million homes. And nobody's even beginning to dent that solution. And because of that, we have this crazy situation where the cost of construction means that we have turned into renter nation and landlord nation. And if those of you that are thinking, they're thinking, oh, I'm too late in this market and we've had seven years of growth, this goes on for the next 20 to 30 years. And I know either technology fixes it or we get riots on the screen, on, on the street. Those are the only two scenarios, but it's gonna take decades to get there. And you might say, no, 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 it can't happen in the US. It happened in every other developing and developed country. Check out Germany's home ownership rate. Check out England's. Check out any country, pick any one of them, and you'll notice that the number of apartments starting the 1980s increased. We just had 20 or 30 extra years as the reserve currency of the world. And now that's done. And so now, the next 20 or 30 years, we keep getting more and more density and more and more apartments. And you can see that in my last graph. For 40, 50 years, rents in the United States were tied to inflation. CPI is another word for inflation. 2% inflation, 2% rent growth. Makes sense, right? Very reasonable. And you can see just how closely they track. And then starting here, right around 2010, when China and India started their massive and explosive building programs, they completely detached. For the first time in history, there is now no connection between rent growth and inflation. We can have 0% inflation in this country with 10% rent growth. And that is the future that you're going to see in this country. You've never seen it before. You've never seen anything like it. So hopefully now you understand why apartments are by far the most favored class in America. Google this. What is the most favored asset class in America? Apartments. Doesn't matter who's talking about it. It's not stocks. It's not single family homes. It's not anything else. It's apartments. Because there are people who have a billion dollars in their funds that understand all of this stuff. They have people paying for it. So now let's talk about where the heck should you be buying these things? Single family rentals or multifamily apartments? Become a landlord. And if you are a landlord, get more of them. But before that, did you guys think you were going to get away without a sales pitch? <laughs> so there are places in the US where I can build a class B apartment complex, not class C. I can build them in Utah. Utah has a lower cost of living than most places in the US. But it has an incredibly educated population. It has a population that has record low delinquency, which has to do with the fact that the Mormon church pays your rent if you're delinquent. Nowhere else in the US do you have a social net for rent. More, they, they do, the whole state has it. So I can build apartment complexes that are this good looking with amenities like that, and it's a class B. So this is Coyote Creek, and it happens to be in the fastest growing metro in America by a long, long way, and that is St. George, Utah. Utah's only warm city, right? Utah's a cold state, but has one warm city because St. George is actually closer to Las Vegas and Arizona than it is to the rest of Utah. So very beautiful city, very affluent, and that is what my project looks like. We released the project on Monday this last Monday, right, one week ago, at this time, I was teaching the Coyote Creek webinar. It's a $6 million raise. And in seven days, we've raised about $800,000 a day. Today, as I came in here, we had $300,000 shares left. And I'm hoping you guys take them so I can finish my raise and get on with the work of constructing this building. <laughs> So for those of you that want to know the numbers, 
It's 1031 eligible. So you're gonna 1031 into it. It's a 3X equity multiple. Your money's in for five years. The project is a 10 year, but your money's in for five years because we do a massive cash out in, in year five. It's a 3X equity multiple. For those of you that know what this is, it's 20%. And it's in the number one rated metro for jobs, population growth, and income growth in the United States. I should know this. I've been researching this for, for years now. I also have other projects like this gorgeous hotel. It's in Oregon. So this is the hotel. It's a fairy castle hotel. This is the Columbia River. This is Washington State. This is Oregon State. The hotel has its own private waterfall and eight acres of gardens. It has a thousand five-star reviews. Everybody loves the hotel. It is the top-rated hotel in its market an hour from Portland, one hour from Portland. They, the hotel only has one damn problem. It's only 40 rooms. It's only 40 rooms, so it cannot maximize its food and beverage uh, revenue. It cannot maximize its, its wedding revenue. And so we are building this building 50 feet from the existing hotel. So now I'm not building a hotel. I'm extending a wildly profitable hotel by building one next to it. And the top floor is conference rooms. Every single room is floor to ceiling glass facing the Columbia River. And you're about 70 feet above the river at this point if you're on the ground floor. Lastly, for those of you that are interested, I teach how to invest in apartments. This is a, a, a class. It's three days. It's in the San Francisco Bay Area. It costs less than 10% of what everyone else charges. And the reason for that is I lose money on every class. I'm happy to lose it because my business model is predicated around my students coming back two years later and partnering with me. So I have about 400 students running around the U.S. looking for properties in my favorite metros. It's awesome, which is why I don't mind losing money on every single student. So if you're interested in apartment complexes and you don't want to get pitched inside the apartment comp in, inside the class to buy some 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollar package, look into the multifamily boot camp. No pitch, very tangible, very specific, very eye-opening and very very step by step. Absolutely step by step. I'll give you every single step that you need, just like I gave you for the meetups. You know, how do you attend meetups to to raise money? It has a very large raising money module, by the way. By the time you're done, you'll be amazing at raising money. I raise $30 million a year. Uh, I'm going to skip all of these. So it's September 13th, 14th, 15th in the San Francisco Bay Area. If you're interested in being a multifamily syndicator, keep in mind, this is not for people that have five hours a week. This is for people that have 20 hours a week, right? So that's the investment of time that you have to make into it. So, let's end the presentation, best cities in the US. I'm gonna give you two separate listings because what happens is different providers have different ways in which they rank cities, so it's good to have two listings. This one's from realtor.com. I'm also gonna give you commentary on each of them and go through them at very, very high speed. Boston, very expensive market, don't invest there. Miami, also very expensive market. Unless you live there, don't invest there. But here's a much better market. At eight, Boise City, Idaho. This is an incredible, incredible city to invest in. It's within a two-hour direct flight from the San Francisco Bay Area, and prices make sense there. Another better city, notice the yellow. That's because those are cities that I've talked about in previous years for this presentation, and then gone off and invested myself. I bought a multifamily property for about $18 million called the Point of Flamingo. It is on sale for 34 million bucks. Wanna buy? Bridgeport, Connecticut. Connecticut is the most horrible market in, in, uh, in the US other than Illinois to be buying real estate in. This is the only decent market there. I suggest you still stay away from it. Phoenix is a much, much better market. Phoenix has changed. Phoenix was a one trick pony that now is in everything trick stallion. It's an incredible, incredible city to invest in for the 10 years. Do note that right now, Phoenix is so hot that if you touch it, you're gonna burn your hands. But for the 10 year, incredible market. Number four is a phenomenal market, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And you notice that it's yellow because I'm buying in what I consider one of the 
the most amazing missed markets in America, the city of Dalton, Georgia. Dalton, Georgia is where I have my most profitable property. And even though that, that is in Georgia, it serves this city. It's 20 miles away. If there's one place in America where you could just close your eyes and buy a property, it's Dalton, Georgia. El Paso, Texas is the shithole of Texas. Please do not buy anything there. This is a horrible place to invest in. I don't know what the heck it's doing here. It's going to be gone next year. This is a much better city to invest in. I'm so sorry if I offended somebody there, but true, truly a horrible city. I have no idea what it's doing here. Um, Grand Rapids, Michigan is very interesting, right? I'm about to say something that may sound racist, but it's very important to understand that demographics is not the same as racism. Whites are about 55% of the population in this country, but they're in over 90% of the money, 90% of the wealth. So if you track what is known as white flight, it is the process of whites moving out of certain areas and running towards others. You're going to make a lot of money. White flight is occurring from Detroit and Lansing, the two big cities in Michigan, towards Grand Rapids. So the, the incomes in Grand Rapids keep going up at insane rates because people with millions and millions of dollars are moving there from other places. They're not just moving them from Michigan, they're also moving them from Illinois, they're moving them from other states, they're also moving in from Canada, right? Because it's just a great place to live. Grand Rapids, Michigan, I, I, it's not my favorite market because I believe that Chicago, when it implodes, it's a $500 billion bomb and it's going to hurt everything around it. So I don't invest there, but it's truly, if you're in, interested in Michigan, it's a great market. But the market that's coming up next is better. The market that's at the top of this list happens to be in my favorite article. So this is not in the presentation, so I want you to write this down. Opportunity, the, the, sorry, Corridor of Opportunity Space Neil Bawa. Corridor of Opportunity Space Neil Bawa. Hit enter, and Google will basically serve up an article for you. And this is a corridor, it's a 245 mile stretch of freeway. And it starts in the city of Deltona above Orlando, runs through Orlando, turns southwest, runs through a city called Lakeland, turns, hits Tampa, turns south, goes through Bradenton, hits Sarasota, turns south again, and ends in Cape Coral and Fort Myers. 245 miles of insane amounts of real estate money. It's the greatest still single corridor of opportunity. And in the middle of its corridor of opportunity is the city of Lakeland, Florida. I think it is an insane opportunity for single family, for multifamily, whatever the heck kind of family. Go buy storage units there. It's, this is ridiculous. Anytime a city is in between two insanely fast growing city, that compression that comes from both sides drives up prices like I've never seen any other way. And Lakeland is commutable to Orlando and commutable to Tampa, right? You can live there and work in both directions. Husband could work in Orlando, wife could work in Tampa, and that's why compression is happening. There used to be a city in Texas called New Bronzefels that was commutable to both San Antonio and Austin, and that city had the highest growth in America for a number of years. Compression is amazing, and Lakeland has crazy compression. Here's the second one. This is a different provider. This, this happens to, I think this is Zillow. Memphis is a very crime-ridden city. Okay to invest in, but you want to see more, more population growth before you invest in it. But Atlanta is much better. I have three properties there. Atlanta is a very, very strong market at this point in time. There are rough areas in Atlanta, but in general, much more population growth much more income growth, much higher inbound migration from other states than Memphis has. Philadelphia is a decent market, but it's been losing population for 50 years, so be careful about that. Don't want, don't want to go into cities that are losing population. Fort Worth is incredible. Dallas is, fund, based on pure fundamentals, the best place in America to invest in, but it's also the hottest place right now. It's super hot, but the market that's 20 miles away right? DFW is Dallas-Fort Worth, is an incredible market to invest in. I'm really happy with my investments in both Atlanta and Fort Worth. Indy is a very strong market for a lot of different reasons. I think this is a market that's about to happen. It hasn't really popped yet. I'm not going to name it as the underperforming market, though it came very close, but I think this is, this is a future market. Keep in mind, Indy is also very high crime, so you may want to buy in a B area. 
Cleveland, I don't recommend it because of population loss. It's still losing population. Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, well, I should say, North Carolina is the only state other than Utah where every metro is gold, right? Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Asheville, RTP, doesn't matter. All of those are incredible places to invest in, but they've got the same problem as Utah. Low cap rates, which means high prices. If you can wait for your returns, this is on its way to something great. So take a look at Charlotte. And as you can see, I'm invested there. And you can start, start seeing that out of 3,000 cities in the US, I've hit a bunch of home runs because these are 10 out of the top, out of 3,000 cities in the US. So I'm also invested in Jacksonville, which is a just straight up terrific city to invest in. In my mind, now that it's gotten over the whole, you know, military was 50% of the jobs, now they're down to 14%. It's now just an incredible place to invest in. But the city that's at the top of the list is once again in the corridor of opportunity. So it doesn't matter if it's Realtor.com or Zillow, the city is at the center. Oops, Raleigh at two. Let's skip that. Great city. Orlando. At number one is Orlando. And the big reason why Orlando is gr do growing has nothing to do with Mickey Mouse. Nothing to do with Mickey Mouse. In fact, that portion continues to fall. The amount of investment that, that Disney's making is, as a percentage, is nothing compared to what everybody else is doing. Go to Orlando. They're building $2 billion retirement cities, not communities. They're building entire cities near Kissimmee. The, the kind of scope of growth that Orlando has matches China, right? You go to Shenzhen, you see like people building 40 or 50,000 units. When you go to Orlando, you see people building 10,000. The scope is insane. And the big reason is the hurricanes, right? A lot of people believe that they should not be investing in Florida because of the hurricanes. That, in my opinion, is total bullshit, right? And here's a very simple way to prove me right and prove whoever's thinking that wrong. Here's a $200,000 home in California. Here's a $200,000 home in Florida, right? Now, in California, go out and buy earthquake insurance. And in Florida, go out and buy hurricane insurance. Now compare the two. You'll notice that you're paying about a tenth of what earthquake insurance in California costs for that hurricane insurance. Do you think insurance companies are idiots? They're in the business of risk management. They've calculated that risk. The chances that this house is going to be destroyed by a hurricane are one-tenth of the chances that your home in California is going to be destroyed by an earthquake. The last reason you want to not invest in Florida is hurricanes, right? So why is Orlando doing well? Well, because insurance premiums are still going up around the coast, right? They're going up slowly. So ex companies that have billion dollar in investments are choosing to make them in Orlando. By the time a category five that might hit and decimate Miami turns inward, inland, and hits Orlando, it's now a category three storm. As a result, Orlando has never been flooded in its history, not once. So from all parts of Florida, people are moving to Orlando, making it have some of the fastest job growth and population growth in all of America, which is why it's at the top of this list, right? Sadly enough, there were no California cities for single family in this list this year. There were plenty last year. So this is a big change. The good news is, the rental market is up next, and there is a California city. Actually, there's three of them in the top 10 list. Do you know why? All multifamily people have a crystal ball. And that crystal ball is an 18th month crystal ball. Once a city is at the top of these two lists, 18 months from now, it's gonna be at the top of the multifamily list. Why? Because all that growth, all that home price growth means that people that were just on the cusp of getting their home now can't afford it. Right? And then you're like, okay, I tried, I tried, I just can't afford it, my income level is not high enough. But they've got a lot of money. So they, when, when I go and buy these C properties and I rehab them and make them look really, really nice, they look like B properties, all of those people go in there. Right? So multifamily guys have a crystal ball. So simply by looking at the last two slides, and I'll tell you where to get these slides, by the way, simply by looking at them, you have an 18-month window into future, into the future of multifamily. So Atlanta, no doubt a great market for multifamily. 
Denver, super expensive, far too late, don't touch it. Raleigh, expensive, but a great 10-year market. Orange County, in California, but there's a better one coming than Orange County that you might want to look at. Twin Cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis. Of the cold states in America, there's only one doing well, and that happens to be Minnesota. Phoenix, fantastic city to invest in for anything, single family, multifamily, rentals, doesn't matter. Los Angeles, great city to invest in right now for multifamily, not a good city to invest in for single family. Seattle, the problem is too much new construction. You see the reds? That's huge amounts of new construction. So in general, I warn people to stay away from places which are significantly over 3%. If that number is a lot over 3%, then I tell you, don't go in there. Las Vegas, phenomenal market, right? A lot of people, three, four years ago, I was standing up here and saying, Vegas is the best market to invest in America. And people would just laugh at me, right? They think that I was basically a gambler. And I basically would say, the reason you should invest in Vegas is none of you want to. From 2008 to 2015, Clark County was the fastest growing county in America in population, but there wasn't a crane to be found in Vegas for seven straight years. When you have this much growth and nobody builds anything, you end up with a massive deficit. In Yardi Matrix's last 11 or 12 monthly newsletters, the city with the highest rent growth in, Amer in America has been Vegas, Vegas, Vegas. Orlando, no doubt. It's, it's just at the cusp of too much construction, but given its job growth is so insane, I think it's still okay to go in there for multifamily. At number two is Dallas. Once again, challenges with new construction. So you're going to have a couple of years that are going to be bad rent years, but if you, if you like 10 years, Dallas is a great market. And then at the very top of this list, is a city that you're going to be extremely surprised about. But 10 seconds after you look at it, you're not going to be surprised because you're going to go, oh, okay, that's why Sacramento is, is the number one market in the United States for rentals. Yeah, it is at the top of the list. And the reason for that is because it was at the top of the other list for 2018 and 2017. You notice that it's no longer in those lists. It was number one on both lists as late as last year. On 2017, it was in the top five. It's falling on the single family side. When they exit on the single family side, they start going up on the multifamily side. So it was at number six last year and is now at one. It remains one of the top rental markets in America, and I don't think that's going to change for the next two years. I skipped over one because we're in Northern California, but for those of you that believe that Sacramento is overheated, there's a market cheaper than Sacramento. And the reason why it's cheaper is right there. Do you see this 0.3? You see this 1.1? Sacramento, you can still build new stuff, right? Which moderates the rent growth because when the new stuff comes in, it pulls down your rent growth. But Inland Empire is not quite where anybody can build new stuff. Does anybody know where Inland Empire is? Riverside, right? So Riverside and all the areas heading into the desert are Inland Empire. If you must invest in California, you cannot go wrong investing in Riverside. There's no new construction coming in, which means that if you can raise rent 3% this year, next year it's going to be 4.5. And the year after, it's going to be 6 until they start building some new construction. So you get plenty of runway. In my mind, you get five years of crazy rent growth if you go out and buy something in Riverside right now. First year, no, no rental profits. The next five years, awesome. Let's end with my two picks. But before we end, I want to tell you about my toolkit. So everything that I showed you today is 1% of the research that I do to put all this stuff together, right? Because there's all these articles that I have to put stuff, pull out stuff from. I give that library away to anybody that wants it. And lots and lots of people here will want to take a look at that library because it's detailed and it updates every month. So every month I add new videos, new articles, new studies. All of this can be used by anybody in this room who wants to sell their investors on whatever project it is that you're doing. So hopefully you use it well and not to, you know, um, hoodwink them. But the library is at, time to pick up your pens, multifamilyu.com 
slash toolkit. There's no subscription. Nobody will attempt to charge you anything. Nobody will attempt to sell you anything. Just come there every quarter and you have this amazing array of brand new material for both. There's a section for California and then there's, a, there's the, the US. So the toolkit is meant to be free for everyone to use. Feel free to give it away to other people as well. Let's end with my picks. Underperforming market was an easy, easy pick this year for me. The underperforming market in the US is Kansas City, Missouri. KC Mo is just in the right place at the right time. And as late as yesterday, as it was ranked again, number one by another one of these newsletters. Doesn't, not the best market in the US to invest in, but it's cheap. You will get cash flow from day one, and a lot of investors need that. You'll get plenty of cash, cash flow in KCMO. Keep in mind, there's crime there. You're gonna have to deal with that. So buy wisely, but it's in a very, very healthy place. It's not the best market though, because by far the best market in the US for the second year running is Boise, Idaho. Boise is an incredible market. Terrific inward net migration from all states in the US. High livability, ranked on many, many best places to live. Very business friendly, great job growth, low crime. It is the only American city in the top 10 safest city lists in the world. We've only got one city in that list. It has the its largest single family projected price growth in the US. And that's by Ingo Windsor of Local Market Monitor. Very, very good schools, beautiful outdoors, and extremely low property taxes. And that is why, for the second year running, my pick for the best place in America to invest in for real estate is Boise, Idaho. We do 50 webinars a year on multifamilyu.com. They're incredible. The people that I bring in no pitches are allowed. These are experts at their areas, like that guy who wrote the book on due diligence, like that guy who's an expert on multifamily financing. And then that woman that will tell you how you can safely and legally put 100 investors into your projects. The other, the other guy, is, is, he's pretty bad, so, so ignore him. But the rest of these guys are pretty awesome at what they do. They're not pitch men. They're simply looking to grow their databases so check out the webinars. There is one running right now. There's a webinar running uh, on, on, a, on a technology tool that's incredible. So they, the, my, my partner, Anna Myers, that's her on the right, is, uh, is running that webinar. And we do one to two of those webinars every week. You have an incredible chance to learn, and there's no cost. So keep coming to multifamilyu.com, but most importantly, keep coming here because you're going to learn incredible, incredible skills. We've got a... a, a Tremendous array of speakers in the next 12 months. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Questions? Usually, everyone's like, who wants to be first? And then they can't stop talking. So I have to cut it off at some point. Questions? Yes. What about rent control? Well... I have nothing good to say on rent control. I think that rent control is a disease that spreads. Rent control is a problem. I wouldn't, I'm not opposed to rent control if it actually worked. I think that it would be a great idea if it works. But if you look at the last 20 years of rent control, all it does is makes the problem worse. So I do not understand why California continues to try for rent control. Oregon just implemented statewide rent control. I think it's only a matter of time here, which is why I say, I, I'm, I proudly say, I'm a liberal Democrat, cut me, I'll bleed blue, but I only invest in red states. All of my investments are in red states. How would that affect your uh, multifamily projects? Probably pretty, pretty significantly, but actually not as much on the rent side. The vast majority of rent control numbers that they're putting out there seem to be reasonable. Like Oregon allowed up to six or 7% annualized rent growth. We're at the end of this cycle. I think that you should be pretty ha happy with six to 7% rent growth. The problem is cap rates. The problem is not rent. You're, the cap rates in California never factored in rent control. 
you get rent control in here, your three cap property is going to become five cap. So you can make profit from it for 20 years. When you sell, you're going to lose every single dime you made. That's what I'm afraid of. I have no solution for that. That's why I have no interest in investing in California because rent control is inevitable. In the end, the mobs win. There's too many people asking for rent control. The bus driver, the Starbucks person, barista, they're all asking. They don't know what they're asking for. They don't know that they're about to make the problem worse. But there's far too many of them asking for it to not get implemented. So it's a populist thing. Yes? Have I looked at modular construction? Yes, I look at modular construction. What I'm finding is for the most part, it doesn't save me money, it saves me time. So time seems to be the bigger deal. I think we need to give modular constructions another 10 years. I think what really needs to happen is somebody needs to come along and invest five or $10 billion. Just like we took a bet on Tesla as a country, right? And we invested 20 or 30, not right now, I think we've invested $30 billion into Tesla. There has to be a modular company with that much scale for it to be cheaper. Everybody that's told me modular construction is cheaper, I found it to be a sales pitch. It's not cheaper, it's faster. So it does save money, and I think it's going in the right direction, but I haven't seen enough of it yet. There's a few very, very interesting concepts coming into the marketplace, but they're very slow to scale. Yes? Uh, what kind of metrics? There's so many. No, I use a, a set of metrics that's completely different. Write this down. Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y dot com, Udemy dot com slash real focus. You'll see thousands of students taking a course that is about those metrics. I teach it. It's free. Mm-hmm. For multifamily. Yes, it didn't show up in the single family list at all. Sure. Well, the short answer is that at this point, everyone's list does not take rent control into effect. So you can't, they're not using speculation, they're using data. At this point, there is no impact of rent control on that data because rent control doesn't exist in California but I believe it will, which is why I'm not investing. Question is, you know, how many of your 1,200 investors are, are currently invested? So we've just crossed 500 actively invested. The other 700 have called us, filled out forms on our website, and spent at least an hour talking with us, and are now actively coming to all of our webinars. But many of our projects are not right for them. The biggest single reason is we don't take 25 or 50K. So they're waiting for some project where I'll drop that number to 25 or 50. So we, we only accept a minimum of 75K. Most of our projects are 100K, so that's the problem. And going once, going twice. All right. Thank you so much once again. That was awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> it was funny. I was at the back of the room talking with Dwight, and we were both really impressed with your energy level tonight. <laughs> He's often called the mad scientist of multifamily, and now you can see why. All right, so just a couple quick announcements. So if you guys are like me and can't get enough of uh, Neil's material, uh, we also host the San Mateo Meetup, which is going to be next Wednesday, July 24th. It's going to basically be this format, except he's going to be focusing on just the Bay Area. So if you guys invest in Bay Area or are interested in what's happening in the Bay Area, uh, it's called the San Francisco Bay Area Health Check. Uh, very similar. He's kind of updating on what's happening there. Similar format to what you just saw. Um, and then again, uh, next month, we'll be ho hosting the multifamily meetup. Uh, we don't have a topic yet, uh, but you'll be getting contacted with information um, 
I think this is the sixth meetup we've had for multifamily now, and we've always had awesome content. Uh, so we hope to see you at the next one. Uh, also, if you're interested in the real estate roundtable, our next meeting is next Monday night. We're going to have more, uh, Matt, the mortgage guy, uh, talk about non-QM, uh, so non-qualified mortgages where uh, similar to stated income qualify with not on income. Uh, so for you real estate investors out there interested, particularly in single family, uh, there's all sorts of new loan products coming out uh, for investors. With that being said, I thank you. Good night. Uh, stay in network. Neil's going to be here for a while, so make sure you get a chance if you need to talk to him. Um, thanks to all my volunteers, and thanks for you all for coming out. See you next time.